the podcast engineering show session number eight hit it (laughs) i didn't like the way i said that hit it boys anyway yes i have my own band here in the studio welcome everybody i'm chris curran i'm your host this is the podcast engineering show this is the show where we talk shop we really get into production techniques and we you know, talk to podcast producers, engineers, and other specialists about their equipment and their workflow. I actually have a background in audio engineering in the music business. And since I entered podcasting about four years ago, I've noticed a huge lack of audio skills in podcasting in general. And that's where this show can help. So if you take the best of what you learn here and implement it, your shows will sound a lot better. You'll spend a lot less time producing them and um, just be more, I don't know, skillful as an audio guy. Uh, Of course, we talk about mostly audio, not video podcasts. Although I'm not against having a a video podcaster on and talk about how that all works. Uh, Maybe we'll do that in the future. Of course, Barry is here with me. He's the maintenance guy in the building here. Barry, are you ready? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. He's ready. Barry, do you think we should, you think we should uh, go, you know, wait a little while before we start the show? No way. Okay. Yeah, I'm t- tighten that one up and post. Jeez. So this show is brought to you by two companies that I'm involved with. One is Podcast Engineering School. It's a school that I started, and it's going to take a while to get going. But the school teaches uh, new people how to launch a podcast. It teaches existing podcasters how to get better with their audio skills. And it also teaches people who want to have a career as a podcast producer. There's been job postings lately. Uh, Amazon, Panoply, a lot of people are, you know, want and need podcast engineers and producers. And well, where's the school that teaches that? Well, I don't think there is one. So I started one and it's going to take a while to get off the ground. Hopefully it's successful. I have a good vision for it, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, Podcastengineeringschool.com. The other sponsor is Fractal Recording providing the podcast production of the highest quality to companies, authors, and podcast networks. And yes, I can say it because it launched. My company, Fractal Recording, is producing the Forbes Podcast Network, which is very cool. So Forbes.com slash podcasts. I think that's the URL there. Uh, So Fractal Recording, I produce shows for people. FractalRecording.com. On this show, you can listen and subscribe in iTunes and Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and anywhere you hear a podcast, whatever podcatcher you uh, listen to. Today, seriously, we're honored to have Todd Cochran as our guest here. He's in the Podcast Hall of Fame. That's right. He's been podcasting since October of 2004. He's best known now, well, he's known for a lot of things, but the big one in the podcasting world is that he's the CEO of Raw Voice Blueberry, which is a huge media host. You know, as you know, podcasts, MP3s, and media have to be housed somewhere, hosted somewhere. I don't know what the right word is. And uh, his company, Blueberry, does that at the highest level. Uh, Todd, welcome to the Podcast Engineering Show. Hey, Chris. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, you've been doing this for a couple couple minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, 1,106 episodes and about 3,000 interviews. Yeah, just a few. Oh man, 3,000 interviews. That's, a, that's tremendous. So we're going to get into first the speed round where I'm just going to ask you a couple of questions we can cover real quick. But I want to ask you first, back in 2004, I mean, even now in 2016, not everyone has heard of podcasting. In 2004, literally no one must have heard of it, right? Right. It was like, crazy. It was, it was, I mean, we were, I think I was one of the first 50 or 60 shows. So yeah, it was, yeah, you thought we had an identity crisis now, but you ought to seen it. <laughs> right. And I actually know you're big on statistics and your company does a lot of work, uh, you know, uh, giving the best download statistics for, for podcasts, right? You're heavily involved in that. Absolutely. Yeah. So the speed round, let's get into it. Um, let Tell me what shows that you produce and engineer. I mean, I know you host one called, uh, it's here in your bio, bio the New Media Show. Uh, yep. is that the only one you produce an engineer? I do too. Uh, the, the mainstay in which all started it all is Geek New Central at geeknewcentral.com. And, uh, that's the one that, uh, really kind of kicked this whole thing off, uh, 11 plus years ago. 
And then, uh, so that's when it's over 1,100 episodes. And then there's the new media show, which I co-host with uh, Rob Greenley. And uh, Rob works over at, uh, at Spreaker. Uh, him and I have been doing that show. Well, it started off as a Saturday morning tech show. Then it, we changed it on the fly one day to the new media show. And ever since then, uh, I think there's 130 episodes of the new media show. And I think we had 150 of the other ones. So, you know, about 300 on that one. So, and we've been doing uh, just, just a, a wee bit of uh, podcasting. <laughs> That's great. I want to definitely ask Rob to be on this show as well. Um, so I know you have like a nice, real nice setup at your at your place there. Um, so why don't? That's the second question of the speed round is um, your workflow and your hardware. So just sure. overview quickly. Like, we'll get more into it in detail, but overview quickly when you sit when you get ready to record an episode. Take me through the recording and the editing and the all the way up to the publishing. Well, without talking about any of the pre-show stuff, um, I use Adobe Edition um, on, a, on a PC. That's my recording, actually, application. But my flow really, and it's kind of old school because I built this studio 11 years ago before USB was kicking off. But I have a, a Blue Mic mouse microphone, which is, uh, man, I just absolutely love this thing. It leaves my, it, it travels to a, a Solo 610 a uh, microphone preamplifier, and then goes into a Mackie mixer. There's a couple of uh, uh, key inserts there, I guess, or mix minuses, whatever way you want to call them. I run it through a EQ and a, a compressor gate, and also I have this product called a Big Bottom uh, that uh, helps with a little bit of voice processing, and then out via FireWire to uh, to the to the PC and uh, into Adobe Edition. That's the audio chain. I'm, I'm just holding, I'm writing that down. <laughs> the big bottom, uh, is it Aphex? It is. It's an Aphex 204 big bottom. 204. Okay. Because I know they have the oral exciter as well. We used to use the oral exciter and the big bottom in the music, but you use the big bottom on your voice, Todd. Yes, I do. I've got an oral exciter, but I don't use it anymore. Okay. Yeah, that is so cool. I mean, there's so many little ways you can process audio. That's tremendous. Yeah. So then, then you you come out FireWire from your Mackie. Yeah, from the Mackie, and it says I got a sixteen channel uh, Mackie, a little overkill, but I needed four channel inserts to be able to do when I have Skype interviews, or I, I even have a Telios in case someone wants to dial in. Uh, that's really old school. We, I don't think I've used that in three years, mm. but it's still uh, it's still patched into a channel. How old is your Mackie? Is it a sixteen forty two? Uh, I think it's a, he's looking <laughs> 1620i. It's an Onyx. Oh, okay. So it's not too old. It's you know, maybe three, four years old. Right. With the firewire. Right. Cause I actually have a, a Mackie 16 channel, but it's a 1642 VLZ four. And I don't think it has firewire, but I might be wrong. Yeah. But, I think they made the switch somewhere in there to USB, but I, I was still, when I bought this one, it was still firewire. Right, so that's the setup, and then uh, you you take most of your guests on Skype, right? I do. When we're doing the well, what's kind of weird is the new media show was always on Skype, and then when Blab kind of got on the scene, we got better social engagement on Blab. So, as nuts as it sounds, I got this beautiful pipeline to record this fantastic audio. We end up on Blab with uh, all of our guests now. It just seems to be simple, and the and the audio over there is. Well, it's it's not the same chain, but I'm I'm still pleased enough with the audio that I'm you know I'm willing to use it as my master, uh, just because the guests are all coming in there direct and they're not coming through me direct. But um, I often do uh, the way the Skype is set up. I have two independent boxes, so I have two Mac Minis that are running a Skype channel each, and you know, sickening as it sounds, that's their sole function in life. Is, uh, is, is to run that. But um, that was the way I was able to keep the audio clean, be able to bring the levels in clean. If I had a guy that was a little high or low, I could adjust as necessary. But you're going to cringe. Um, I do all my recordings single track. I don't break them out into their own tracks. Okay. That's, yeah. Yeah, not a big deal. And by the way, cr I'm, I don't cringe. I mean, um, <laughs> you, you said it's a, it's a shame that you have a Mac Mini only, only doing you know, connecting one Skype channel. I think that's awesome. <laughs> Dedicated box just for a Skype. I mean, look, that's how, if, if you have the resources and know how to do it, I mean, it's better to do it that way because then there's doesn't tax the, 
the computer and it, it, it just I mean I look I have five computers here five five computers and iPad so yeah I mean I've run a lot of things independent of each other I think that's great I think any audio engineer would would think that's awesome and there's there's you know and what's and the thing is it's what you build no matter what you build it's going to be obsolete six months later so <laughs> Um, when you invest a certain pipeline, sometimes it, you know, until you do a completely revamp, it's expensive to, to rewire. And as you, as you well know, so once you get a, a path that works, that's kind of how it, it, it sticks. Totally. Totally. So when you got into podcasting in 2004, did you have a background in audio or, or just an interest in audio? Uh, you know, I was a blogger. I'd been blogging a couple of years before I was podcasting and there's a story behind how I got started podcasting, but in, in essence, I was in a hotel room in Waco, Texas, of all places. I live in Hawaii, and uh, I was there doing uh, contract support. I was active duty military at the time in the Navy. I was basically making sure taxpayer dollars were being spent right, and the uh, I was I had been hurt, and I was wearing one of those clamshells. I don't know if you ever seen anybody wear one of those where you're basically your whole body's encased from your waist all the way up to your armpits, and uh, um, and it was hot. So I was spending a lot of time in the hotel room with the AC cranked up and I was surfing the internet and I found this thing, you know, I heard Dave Weiner and Adam Curry talking about podcasting on the daily source code. And I mean, I caught the bug. I went and, and there was a Walmart on the, directly across from the hotel, across the highway. And, uh, my first audio recordings was very sophisticated. I had a 1495 lab tech headset. <laughs> And uh, plug straight into the audio port. I think the first seven shows were recorded that way. And then I made the trudge to a uh, guitar center there. You know, Amazon wasn't available. There was huh. you know, a lot of stuff was not online then yet. So I uh, went to guitar center and bought an MXL 990 and a Behringer <laughs> cringe uh, mixer. And <laughs> it went from there. Yeah, that is tremendous. And as you, you know, you had to put all this audio equipment together once you started to upgrade the equipment and stuff. Were you always comfortable with that, or was it ever really difficult? No, I was a techie already, so I'd worked in electronics for a long time. And matter of fact, I probably had an advantage over other people because I was cognizant of ground loop noise and all that stuff. So, um, you know, and what I did early on, and, and I'll be honest with you, is, uh, you know, I kept hearing these horror stories about new people um, in the space that were spending all these hours editing bad audio. And when I had come home and told my wife, I'm doing this thing, podcasting, and it's going to take four to five hours twice a week, and I got the eyeball from her, <laughs> um, you know, she says, she says, spend the money you need to spend to reduce the amount of time you have to stay in the studio. And I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's permission. <laughs> so uh, I went out and at the, and I've upgraded stuff over the years, but at the time I went out and bought the best audio chain I could so that what went in the mic and what went on the recorder was pretty doggone close. And then all I really had to do was a few tweaks on the audio editing. And I'm one of these guys that uh, is a start record, stop record, um, cut the ends, uh, do the, and I use a phonic today to do the finalization on the product, but I have a filter that I run things through that I worked with Paul Fagiani on. And then, uh, basically put out the produced product and my audio actually editing post show is 10 minutes tops. Uh, I do not go in and remove the us, ums, huzz, all that. It is what it is. And that's why I've done it for 1100 episodes. And quite frankly, it's kept me married. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, most importantly, <laughs> wow. Right. So I'm not spending two, three hours doing post editing. Right. So what do you think is your greatest strength in terms of audio production? Oh, well, I think the greatest strength is using resources. You know, I, I've relied heavily on uh, fan feedback and I've I relied heavily on uh, guys like Paul, which is he's a you know great friend and I've known him for many years. And if he sees something that's getting out of tweak or I send him an audio file and I said, what do you, what do you think? What, what do we need to do? And he'll come back at me and, and we'll go back and forth till we get it right. So. Uh, you know, sometimes uh, you'd love to have a studio where you could s set it or forget it. But just like anything else, your voice can change over time. You can have uh, degradation in cables. You just, you know, it's something you have to, com you know, you have to look at your stack on a regular basis. And I'm not saying every day, but I'm saying, you know, you should take a, a, a hard listen at least once a month on your audio. 
make sure the kids haven't come in and bumped a dial or something. <laughs> and um, so really that's been my greatest strength is relying on third parties. I, for me, it sounds good. And then someone comes back and says, uh, that was a little hot or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. But also learning to stay on mic, uh, that comes with practice. But, um, you know, having a great mic in the, in the front end, probably that that's my biggest investment you, you go out and price the uh the mouse from blue mic it's not a cheap mic so you know it was really the uh having the best in and out now there's great mics today you can buy for under 100 bucks but 10 years ago that wasn't the case right so let's yeah so let's start stepping through your process in a little more detail i'm glad you brought up the mic again the mouse um how much did you pay like what what level of investment was that uh, I'm Googling it here to see what the current price is on it. Um, oh, it's still available? Yeah, it's still available. Okay. Um, it's about 1200 bucks. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's not a cheap cheap mic. And, and you know, I, I have a stack of mics. I have, I've got a Heil PR90 for my voice. Hate it. Okay. I've got a, a, um, an NTK from... Um, Newman, I think, use that for a number of years. You know, I've had a number of mics, and I use a condenser mic. Most folks use Dynamics. Right. Dynamics, I hate the sound of my voice on a Dynamic. I like the sound of my voice on a condenser. I have control of my environment in the studio. Mm. So no mic fits every person. It really, you know, if you get a mic, and if someone's listening, and you got a mic, and you're listening to yourself, and you, you hate it, um, send, that, send that mic back. You know, right. but, you know, try to get some usage out of it. But really what I have found with this uh, Blue Mouse microphone is that um, it, it works for me. It may not work for everyone. And uh, it really depends on your voice. You know, I love the Heil PR, PR90 from a style standpoint. But put my mouth up to it and what comes out of it and what ends up on the recorder, I'm just, ugh, it makes my skin crawl. Yeah. So, yeah, it really has to be a match. And that's interesting that it's good that you can hear the difference and you settled on the one that you really like. Uh, so you take your microphone into a Solo 610 preamp. Um, so you're basically, what are you doing to your mic signal before it reaches the Mackie? Just the preamp? Just the preamp. And the, you know, really, the reason I got the Solo 610 is I was running the PR90 for two or three months. And it just needed so much amplification mm -hmm. that I bought the 610 on a whim saying, man, I need something in front of the, because I had the, the amplifiers on the mixer just cranked. And what was causing then was getting, shh, you know, the yeah. background noise from the, even though it was a great Mackie mixer, it just wasn't enough to drive that mic. So I bought that Solo 610 and that fixed that problem. But ever since then, that is a tube-based um, amplifier and it just does something. There's something about tube amplifiers, for, at least for me, that I just absolutely love. It just gives a different sound. Yeah, yeah. You and almost everyone else who's heard the difference, absolutely. Tube tube amplifiers are much different than solid state, and it's interesting that you know different. Most people don't know this. Different microphones have different output levels, right? And it really does, you know, some some mics have such a weak output level that, yeah, you have to crank the mic pre to get it to to do anything. It reminds mm -hmm. me of when I, I was setting up my studio about four years ago in New Jersey, and I needed, I wanted to get um, four, three different handheld microphones to to put around a table, because I was it was going to be four of us sitting around a table, and I, I need to buy three other mics. And of course, when you think of a handheld mic, you always, the first thing you think of is a, a Shure SM58. That's like the standard handheld mic and so i went to the music store it was a guitar center and i had them give me like three or four handheld mics and i brought my digital recorder i brought a cable and i went and i stood in one of these side rooms and yeah. i'm sitting there using each one talking into it talking into it and the the 58 ended up being kind of dull and a little well the output was probably fairly normal but this other mic a sennheiser e835 the output was much stronger and it was much more present so i bought those and uh, and actually that's one of the benefits of that mic the e835 is that 
it has a higher output so you don't have to crank the mic pre as much because like you said when you crank the mic pre then you're introducing the noise of the mic pre that's why mic pre's are so important like like the mic is important the mic is probably the most important thing when it comes to sound. The next thing is the mic pre. <laughs> and most podcasters don't use mic pre's. Most of them go straight to the mixer. Right. And if it's a Mackie, it, the Mackie preamps are usually pretty clean. They're uh, pretty clean. But if you're driving a dynamic mic, right. condensers don't need near as much um, you know, amplification. But if you're running a dynamic mic, you, you may be cranking more than you want on that pre and then you may have more stuff to do in post yeah all that noise that's generated or that's if like, you have it set too low and then you got to work the amplitudes up and that you know has its own issue oh yeah yeah if it if it ends up too low yeah if the record level's too low then you crank it up yeah. later then you introduce more noise that way <laughs> that's like one of the things about audio engineering that's one of the key things that an engineer is always doing is making sure the levels are good and that everything is gain staged properly, meaning that the output of one piece of equipment is, is the proper output so that on the input of the next piece of equipment, the input is proper and just balancing all that to keep that noise out. That's like, you know, it's yep. not hard to do once you know how to do it, but that's where a lot of noise can come in. So then you go into the Mackie and then you, ha you use some inserts here. Now you use inserts on only your microphone or on all the guests as well. Uh, I have two of the channels set up for uh, processing um, because that's really, I never, when I built the system, I never thought I would have more than two people on at one time. But so my primary co-host is on a channel. Uh, so his voice gets processed. The guest does not, but been kind of lucky. I've been surprised that uh, there really um, hasn't been a big noticeable difference. Um, I've been able to, I've had good luck. It, it, and every once in a while, you get someone that's just on a bad connection or have a bad, uh, you know, maybe a bad headset or trying to use a wireless microphone or something to that effect. It causes problems. But usually, the the, the myself and my co-host are at least we're being processed. Okay, and you mentioned uh, EQ, a compressor and a gate, and the big bottom. I got a DBX two fifteen for the uh, EQ. And then I have a, a DBX266XL 266, compressor gate. Um, and that's, this is the, in the chain of things, it goes EQ, gate, uh, big bottom. I think that's how I've got them stacked. Got it. And so you have it on the insert. So as you're recording, it's going through all the processing and then it comes out of your mixer and you're recording it. So you're you're processing all you're processing those two channels to tape um do you use much of your gate i'm curious i do and i'm in a 10 by 12 my room is 10 by 12 but here in hawaii most homes do not have uh air conditioning because we have enough trade winds we don't need it i do have wall units if i need to run ac but that you know that just invokes all kinds of terror in in audio recording with the background noise so typically, and I run here in the studio with the windows open. So every once in a while, truck will drive by or something like that. But remarkably, that gate is set just enough that we never hear um, any of that background noise. So, and I'm also, the microphone is not, the microphone's facing the windows. So I'm not necessarily getting, uh, you know, it's not coming over my shoulder into the mic. So that helps well as well for isolation. I, I, in, in the actual room itself, um, there's carpeting. I do have a couple of things on the walls. Um, and, and I don't use the traditional stuff you buy from Sweetwater or something like that. But I put, I've got some stuff on the walls that basically helps with, uh, with isolation. My biggest challenge is I have a huge monitor directly in front of me. So I have to sit back as far as I can from that monitor to not get bounced back from the monitor into the microphone. But uh, overall, pretty good on isolation as far as the compressor gate goes. And you use a fair amount of compression? I mean, I think right now I can hear a fair amount on you. Yeah, I do use quite a bit. Okay. And it's a DBX 266 XL, you said. So do you have the famous over easy and auto buttons pressed? No. <laughs> no, I do not. I'm running those manually. 
Oh, you are. Okay. What what kind of ratio do you have it set on? Uh, let's look. Let's look. I love this. <laughs> Threshold is twelve. Let me look at the ratio. Uh, the ratio is just about three to one. Oh, the actual threshold is zero. Sorry. Okay. On the compressor, two to one. Oh, two to one. Okay. Attack is like mid range. They don't give a percentage. Got it. Release, same thing, mid range. Okay. And output plus four dB. Right. Oh, that's awesome. So two to one, you're hitting it, you're not killing it. And um, what's like, oh, now after the show, Todd, you can take a picture of your compressor and tweet it with the link to this episode. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That'd be cool. And I take, you know, I've uh, I had young kids, so I had pictures of all this stuff because you know kids come. Oh, there's a knob. Let me go turn that. <laughs> right. Oh, so you took pictures of all the settings, right? Yeah. Right. All right. Here's and I had tape over everything. Yeah, go oh, t- okay. So the big bottom, you're you're not actually adding that much bottom because I've heard huh. some people, podcasters. I shouldn't say some. One comes to mind that was way over the top. You know, it's like he wanted to have this big radio voice and he added so much low end that it literally made him hard to hear, like compared to the other voices in the podcast. So you're not adding that much, actually. Uh, All the three controls on the big bottom are exactly 50%. They're, They're, and maybe the. Maybe the mix is a, a little. Maybe it's at fifty-five or sixty percent. Okay, got it. Yeah, so that's I'm that much. That, yeah, that's one thing I would just caution podcast engineers in general is you got to be careful not to add too much low end or too much high end. You know, it's yeah. you know it, it's well known in audio engineering that the fil- filters are your greatest friend, the high end filter and the low end filter, mm-hmm. because and and usually those are the first two knobs that I tweak when I'm starting to EQ something. I'll just immediately go to the low end filter and just start rolling off the low end and, and hearing how it sounds. And, and I roll off as much as needs to be rolled off. Same thing with the high end. If someone is, if it's really a lot of high frequencies that are almost hurting your ear, you just, you know, you can use a high, high end filter. And I use the high Z more than the low Z on my Solo 610. I actually, matter of fact, I have it in high Z I do the filter on high Z on the Solo 610, but I think on the exciter part of the big bottom, I'm I have that less. Those are like a quarter each, um, so you know it's two different settings on that thing. So and it, it is you can you can crank that thing so it's like sounds really bad. And here's the reason I added the big bottom. Um, I don't have a real bassy voice, so wanted to add just a little bit of you know that bottom end to help um, help with the and not so much that it would be like weird, but just a little bit added. And believe it or not, I don't know why I bought it. I think I got someone told me about it and thought it would be good, and it seemed to work. And it's been in the stack uh, ever since. Yeah, if it, if your voice was a little thin beforehand, now it's definitely much more full and and just more. See, that's one thing about audio that, as engineers, we have to realize. <clears throat> Whatever we're doing to the audio is to provide the listener with a good experience. Right. And if someone's voice is a little, you know, if, if a little more low end would make it sound a little better, then you just add a little low end. So that that's, I like that. I like what you did there. And cut the high. You know, that was, you know, so you, you try to, you know, smash it in there a little bit and get it where it needs to be. And, and be honest with you, um, it's really in the, I, I call it your ear ball. It's all in your ear ball. It's all in the ear of the beholder. It's, yeah. you, you know, you, you can only do the best you can do to uh, get it where you need to be. And, the, and, and, and dialing a system in is, it can be difficult. Right. One thing I just thought of too, that I want to mention for our listeners is that different, because this happens to me all the time. I have clients, I record shows, I record guests and hosts and every, a lot of different people. And when one of the voices on an episode is really compressed a lot and another voice on the episode is not compressed a lot or at all, it's actually more difficult to, to get the levels on those two tracks because the, the compression makes the compressed track seem louder, but it's really not louder. And then the other track that's not compressed is has more dynamic range. So sometimes it's louder, sometimes it's not. So along with mixing for volume, you actually, in a way, 
it, it can come in handy to mix the amount of compression as well. Like if one voice is really compressed a lot, you might have to compress the other voices more just to, so it sounds more normal together with the other person. You know, and, and I'm fortunate, you know, it's just the challenge I think in the podcasting space today is, is I, you know, I went out and spent the big bucks, you know, I got four or $5,000 worth of stuff in the stack. And the average podcaster, that's, that's not an option, you know, so they are going to be, you know, they're going to be using a single mic, probably USB into a, um, into a computer. But, you know, thank goodness, this is where then you can, you know, if you're using Audition or using one of the pro recording tools, you can start snapping in plugins to do some of the same stuff that I've done with, with hardware. Um, it's, it's a little more tricky. In fact, I think those systems are harder to dial in than getting just a, a rack full of stuff to cooperate. But, um, you know, that they both have their techniques and uses. So, and I'm sure you're covering this in some of your series, talking about those folks that have exactly that type of a setup, a microphone and a computer and how to use plugins to, to I guess for a better word, better their sound, right? Yeah, plugins are definitely useful. And if, if anyone's listening who has that setup where you have a USB mic recording straight into the computer, two things are great to remember and probably the most important things record at the highest resolution possible and also make sure you're recording at a nice strong healthy level uh, those two things will make any plugins you use way better for you so uh, so let's get into the resolution because you come out of your mixer firewire and go right to a pc so what resolution do you record in and where do you choose that resolution on the on the mixer uh, I'm recording. N no, it's uh, at the uh, PC. At the PC, so you know, I'm I'm obviously at uh, recording at forty four dot one, and then uh, what is it? Sixty, sixteen or twenty four bit? Yeah, I think I'm at twenty four bit. Uh, it's uh, you know, I don't know. I've used the same setup for addition. I just click you know record, and it pops up, and I hit go. Right. So I'm assuming. I'm recording at the highest resolution I can with Audition. Right, yeah. Twenty. Well, 24-bit is good. 44.1. Audition may go all the way up to 96K, which yeah, is overkill. I I'm, but I'm, Well, I'm using 44.1 as a sample rate, for sure. Yeah, which is fine. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. So the FireWire... So there's no level... You don't adjust the level on the PC at all. You would whatever no. level comes out of the mixer, that's where it gets recorded at. Yeah, that's the, that's the level. And, and, it, and it basically, I... I've got the stack set up so that um, I'm at Unity on the mixer. I'm at Unity um, on the sliders. Then I've been able to, um, because I've got the uh, Solo 610 and I've got uh, a couple of pieces in between, that's where I tweak the audio levels coming out uh, of the system. But you know, if I'm looking at the recording right now, the highest peaks, at least on the audition scale that we're coming down digitally, is at about minus six that would be the highest peaks with most of the stuff down at uh probably coming in at uh, minus tw between minus nine and minus 12. okay and what meter do you look at when you're getting levels and adjusting levels well let's see here the um there's two different meters on the uh, if i look at the actual um and when i was talk referring to there on for db wise and referring to what i'm seeing but down on the track but if I look at the meter, the level meter on Audition, right now I'm at like between minus 15 and minus 12 on the uh, on the actual uh, what's going down on track. And, right. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I know. Um, yeah, depending on your setup, you can. Well, depending on anyone's setup, there's typically several meters you could look at, but it's always good to have one meter. Like it's always better when you get. Uh, you get used to one meter, how it reacts and the level, and you can, and if you always look at the same meter, you can, you get really a lot better at judging how high the level is. So, um, and I like the fact that you leave all your faders at unity or zero, because that's another mistake some people make is they'll they'll crank the mic pre way up loud, and then they'll be like, oh, that's too loud, and then they bring the fader down. Yeah, you should always. Pretty much try to keep your faders all at zero, just like you're doing, Todd, and then adjust the mic pre because you want the mic pre literally to be as low as possible. Yeah, I even keep my faders on my Mackie 
at plus five. Wow. So I, I put it up even a little more than zero so I can back down on the mic pre a little bit more. But, you know, that's just, that probably doesn't make that big of a difference. But right. but now, now, now everyone knows why. So editing. Oh, well, wait. When you record an audition, do you record stereo or mono? I do stereo. Okay. And where do you play your show? Do you play a show theme music and all that? I don't. And uh, probably the reason I record stereo is just uh, that's why I've been doing it for years. I know a lot of guys record in mono. When you no. publish, do you publish in mono or stereo? Uh, I'll be one guilty. I'm not necessarily concerned about bandwidth, so I do, re I do record in stereo. Okay. I mean, I do encode in stereo. Right. Oh, I love that. I do too, uh, except for my clients who, you know, like Forbes, they're going to have so many downloads that it's yeah. going to cost a lot more. So they cut, they cut their price in half by going mono. Um, one thing you can do, to, I don't know if you do this, but on those two channels that you have, one for you, one for your co-host, you can actually pan yourself a little bit one way and pan your co-host a little bit the other way. And well, that's, the, that's the thing. I put everything down on a single channel. I don't split them. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, so. wait, on your mixer, though. No, I on my mixer when when it comes when it when it comes in it's combined, it's one I can set it up. So I could break out the channels on the Mackie, but I don't. So I wait. So, but I don't understand now because your your microphone is plugged in through your Solo Six Ten, and you're going into one of the channels on the Mackie, yeah. right? And everything is when it comes out of the FireWire. I could choose to make each input a separate channel on the mixer. But I don't. I use a combined output. So I have like a master out, just like you would, you know, if you were hooking a master cable out of the mixer right. into, into a recorder, it has the option to run everything as a single channel recording into Audition. Right, right. You're saying single channel, but it's a stereo signal. It's a stereo single channel, yeah. Right. So you're mixing that. So here's what you're doing you're mixing down everything in your Mackie. It's coming yep. out of your Mackie in stereo, and that's how Audition's recording it. That's right. What I'm saying is on, on your fader, right. you, you have a fader on the mixer. Your co host has another sure. fader on the mixer. You can pan your signal a little bit to the left. Oh, I see what you're saying. And you can pan your co host a little bit to the right. And believe it or not, that little difference in the stereo spectrum will will make each voice come through much more clear. It's oh. definitely try that. It's actually phenomenal how. So crazy I see that is. what you're saying. So actually, I know what you're talking about now. Oh yeah, that uh, would be yeah. So just so you pan it maybe a quarter click or something like that. Uh, not even. You really well. You do it by your ear. So put on your okay. headphones, start panning, and then you'll uh -huh. see what's too much. You don't want to do it too much because. Just a little bit, though. Just a little separation. Just a little separation will make a big difference in the clarity. Because the thing you want to protect against, and I've heard one guy talk about this, he made a case for uh, the reason he mixes everything in mono is because he says, oh, most of the people I know who listen, they listen with one earbud in. Mm. And I was like, that's interesting. So I do the same thing as you. I mix everything down to stereo because I want my theme song to be in stereo because it's music and music in mono is... Not right. The, not great. So and I, but I pan my voices a little bit, one to the left, one to the right, one in the middle, and and you just pan it slightly so that if someone does listen with one earbud, they're still going to hear both about the same volume. It's going to be a very slight difference in the volume. Right. But someone who listens with real headphones or on speakers, they will, you know, they will hear this little tiny bit of separation, and it clears it up a lot. Okay. Yeah, pretty cool. So editing. I know you said you don't do much editing. Um, I do three steps. Okay, go ahead. So the first thing I do is um, I just bring the gain up maybe, and, and it, basically I bring it up to maybe where the, the peaks are at like minus two. Um, and that's just, that's just a quick set. And then I, um, the second step is, is I use a, a multiband compressor in the in an effect in addition that I had someone design for me um, that uh, has um, changes my uh, lows mids and highs uh, frequencies a little bit and actually is a um, has worked out really well um, in getting the audio I guess for a better word more uniform um, and I have a, a preset for that right. then I take 
uh, that output, save it to WAV file to the desktop, and then I run the um, that file through a phonic. I uh, target it minus 16 LUFS. Um, I, in a phonic, I use the adaptive leveler. Uh, there's no really noise or hum in my content, but I, I have that turned on anyway. Okay. But that is the primary settings that I have set up in uh, in a phonic. There's a couple of more. Well, actually, I, I think I leave most everything else default. Um, I do do a maximum peak level at minus 1.5 dBTP um, just in case. Um, then I use uh, the peak measurement algorithm of four times over sampling, but uh, I use the LUFS gated auto. But that is uh, pretty much it, and I'm I'm a big fan of Alphonic. I was uh, going to say, do you know who owns Alphonic? Do you know anyone from Alphonic? I don't, okay. but I use the software version of their program, um, I, and I hadn't used it up until maybe I've probably been using this a year and a half. So this is something new um, that, I, that I've done. And I used to have a, a different process in addition to, get to try to get my audio um, to the level where I needed because I, I had always struggled with being too soft or being too quiet. And uh, this Alphonic just fixes that. But at the same time, it doesn't blow people out. And the other processing seems to work um, to my advantage. So um, is, the, is the audio perfect? Probably not. But uh, I'm happy with it. Yeah, I mean the steps you're taking are 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 great. I mean you're bringing up the level. You're using a multiband compressor. That's like a you could consider that mastering. You said you use another effect. I just use that uh, multiband compressor with a. It's in, that's an isotope plugin, or it actually comes with addition. Okay. Oh, I think I might use the same one. Mine I, mine yeah. is isotope as well. Yeah. If you go to in addition, it's under effects. Amplitude and compression, multiband compressor is the menu item in Audition. Right. And then, and then Alphonic is, I, I use that sometimes myself. Actually, with Forbes, sometimes what I'm doing is there'll be actually three people at a conference table and there'll be a blue Yeti in the middle. Oh. Yeah. And, you know, anyway, Alphonic <laughs> helps that a lot. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I do want someone from Alphonic to come on the show, Todd. So if you if you know of anyone, or I don't know, I mean, I'll I'll work with uh, my people to fit, to see if I can contact someone. But I think that'd be cool to figure out what they're actually doing to the audio. <laughs> right? Yeah, they, it's it, it's really you know it seems to be well used tool by a lot of people. Uh, I think it's a uh, and it, it, the main thing is is it's getting that mi- minus sixteen and. And I'm sure you went over this already. The you know most of these folks are listening to these shows on an MP3 player, and it's a big it's a big deal to have that level right um, going on to those devices. We didn't care about it in early years. We just kind of set it and forget it. So right. we've gotten a lot better with the with the audio processing. Yeah, that the luffs and the volume level really helps out. Uh, what kind of how do you monitor what you're doing? Do you always wear headphones? Do you have speakers? Yeah, I have an in ear. Um, headphones, uh, I think they're sure. And then, um, yeah, I, I don't have, uh, when I'm actually doing my editing, I just stay right on your phones. I don't uh, switch over to a monitor. Okay. So the, sh- they're like earbuds. Yeah. Well, they're, yeah, they're in ear molded kind that they're, yeah, go in your ear. Okay. I've used over the ear headsets, like from Behringer and those types of folks, not Behringer, uh, Belladine and some other folks in the past, but, uh, Currently, I've just been using in ear. Yeah, they're like, they're they're about two hundred dollar earbuds, is what they are. Got it right. They're not. Yeah, they're kind of earbuds, but I wouldn't consider them like in the same league as the cheap earbuds for sure. Definitely not. All right. So um, the only other thing I want to ask you about was, you know, when you connect with people on Skype, some people sound terrible. How do you work with people? How how do you make your Skype guests sound the best? What do you do? Well, I ask them to be on a wired connection versus a wireless, if, if at all possible. That helps a lot. Um, I ask them to um, try to um, get their level set before they call so that when they call in, I also ask them um, if possible, if they don't, if they have a, like a gamer's headset, um, something that's USB that can be plugged in and uh, something with a boom mic that actually 
uh, comes up to their mouth that's better than a uh, a webcam. Um, that is, um, you know, the, the suggestions I give. I still have had guests come on before where they're just using the speaker uh, or using the microphone on the webcam. You, know, you just have to deal with it when they do that. But uh, for the most part, the folks I'm interviewing anyway are involved somewhat in the media space, and they usually have um, a pretty good mic. I've, and I've had people that worried about it, and they've actually went out and bought uh, – Oh, is that forty nine ninety five mic that everyone loves? USB. Um, oh, the Audio Technica. Yeah, so they've actually went out and bought one of those and used that as their right. microphone, and that's got its own challenges. If they don't have it mounted and they're moving it all around, <laughs> it's right. almost worse than having uh, you know using the web the webcam microphone. But right. uh, overall, we've been pretty lucky. Good. Well, Todd, this has been awesome. Um, I want to thank you for sharing your whole setup. I mean, you can tell I love this getting all into the audio part of it. So um, I appreciate you sharing your pretty much everything you're doing and how you're doing it. I think it helps people. And, uh, you know, for someone like you who's been doing it for so long, even though you've, you know, you've had the same setup for a while, still a lot of thought went into it. A lot of care goes into it. And um, I just really appreciate you being on this show. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, absolutely appreciate it. And, uh, you know, one thing about you can have the best setup in the whole world, but if the content sucks, it's still going to (laughs) suck. So podcasters don't get wrapped around the equipment. Great, great content. Yeah. And it's funny because I actually haven't addressed that on the show yet, but I will right now. There are people out there who say audio quality doesn't matter. Create good content and that's all. And 99% I agree, but let's let's be clear audio quality is slightly important <laughs> and it, it has its place we used to be able to get away with it not anymore right that's exactly yeah, yeah actually, now the standard is raised yeah and some people like to have that npr sound but just remember they're, they're speaking into a 2400 four hundred dollar microphone and you're never unless you're going to go out and duplicate an npr studio going to get that sound i actually am anti npr sounding i don't like that breathy, fresh air. I don't like, that's not the sound I want. So get your own sound. Don't, you don't have to mimic NPR or one of these other groups. That's right. Todd Cochran, Podcast Hall of Fame inductee and the CEO of Raw Voice Blueberry. Thanks, Todd. Hey, thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks everybody for listening. You can hear our show on iTunes and Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and our website, podcastengineeringschool.com. I'm happy that you spent some time with us here today. I hope you learned some things. Like I say, this show is a show that you listen to every week and just let this audio knowledge drip into your brain little by little. I mean, you probably learned more than you think you learned in this episode just by hearing us talk about things. So we want your feedback too. So comment on the post of this episode if you have any questions for me or Todd. And um, that's about it for us today. So we'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. And of course, we'll end with our song, Distance Between Two Points. So until next week, you know what to do. Sound great. You walk away from me well, and you can't play that part so well. What do you say?
Yeah, man.